it's a global standard that 70% desks are unoccupied in an organization. Imagine 30% of real estate is unoccupied. And most of these corporates probably have leased premises. So imagine the kind of rentals that they're spending for unoccupied spaces. What is your method of planning and designing a space? Everything starts from a brief. The client will just give you a piece of paper. I need, I am employing 1,000 people or 2,000 people. Therefore, I need 2,000 work desks. I need so many meeting rooms and blah, 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 blah. Any differences you observed uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID in terms of office requirements by the clients? We did an office for Microsoft pre-pandemic where we had <coughs> one work workstation for two and a half employees. I want to understand your definition of luxury. We believe that uh, luxury is more about an experience. It could have a very basic floor, it could have basic wall finishes, but to have the right volume of space for that particular use. It would be different from an office, to a residence, to a hotel, or for an education institute. The needs are different. 10 years down the line, how do you see yourself uh, in the whole architectural world? Retired, sitting on an island, having a drink. Hello everyone, welcome to the Speaking Real Estate Podcast. Today with us, we have a very special guest from the architectural space and world, Mr. Yatan Patel, who is the principal designer and founder at DSP Designs and also founder at Kalagit Collective. I'm very excited and delighted to host you and today is going to be a great session in terms of learning various different things related to this world of architecture. So thank you for being a part of this and agreeing to being a part of this. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me over and looking forward to this. So, would want to start off with your early education and then moving forward, talk about your career journey where you being a first generation architect coming from a business, uh, sorry, coming from a fa doctor's uh, family, how did you get your interested into architecture and what's your journey been thereafter? So, uh, it, it's been a fairly long journey <clears throat> and uh, I... I always had the interest for architecture during our travels uh, in the younger days. I was always fascinated uh, with all the structures that we used to see and that really fascinated me. So, you know, just out of college, the only thing uh, that I could think of was to do architecture. So, uh, <coughs> we w I went to uh, Manipal Institute of Technology. I like to call it MIT. Uh, my daughter now is in MIT, so... We have this thing going that, you know, now we've got to the actual MIT, right? But, <clears throat> no, so it was a, a great uh, experience uh, in Manipal uh, over those five years of intense training of architecture. Of course, we had a lot of fun as well, but uh, all colleges do, right? So, uh, and it was, <clears throat> it was a great experience because uh, we had a very limited capacity in, in the school, right? So we were just 20 of us in a class and we had dedicated uh, teachers with us. So we could, you know, and they were living on campus, so we could reach out to them even at odd hours. So it, it was a more personalized kind of uh, education system, which was great. Uh, which then, just out of college, I worked for a year with with an architect to gain experience and then uh, through my network of friends uh, who were already establishing their own businesses uh, pulled me out, so to speak, and said, you know, we've got all of these projects going, why don't you come and, you know, be a part of those. And then at that young age, I thought I knew it all and I could, uh, you know, start on my own, which much to my later uh, experiences, I realized that that uh, one year stint was not good enough, but uh, I learned the hard way. Uh, thankfully, at other people's expense, not mine. But uh, uh, like I said, I'm a good spender of money, uh, other people's money, right? So that's what you get when you're doing architecture. You, you get to spend other people's money, but <clears throat> in the right way. Right. right. So we started off with doing... Uh, a few retail outlets, uh, fashion outlets, 
a few restaurants, a few hotels. And then we got our first break only after about five or six years to do an office. Uh, we got the opportunity to work for an off uh, office of the Reliance Group, which was, uh, I think, that would have been the changing point of my career because <clears throat> I always liked to do office interiors. Uh, so during my training period, I was doing working on uh, office interiors, so, which was a good break. I think at that point of time, it was all of 5,000 square feet, which at that point I thought it was like, really nice and big, right? <clears throat> so we did that and then it just kept on and on. And uh, the other bigger break that we got was, uh, so that's our, where our journey with the corporate started. So one led to the other. We did a lot of uh, projects with different uh, organizations, all corporates, So which actually defined the way in which we set up our business. So we started working like corporates, em emulating their whole processes and the culture. And then uh, there was this whole boom of uh, the software industry in the country. And there was this global phenomenon of Y2K. So which is when uh, there was a lot of development happening on that side and, you know, a lot of uh, firms... Uh, so the next big thing in our career uh, where we got the opportunity to do a much uh, larger scale offices was when we got our first break to do uh, uh, an office for a software firm. And, we, you know, it was a struggle to really get to that first client. And, you know, we used to make these pitches to clients and they said, have you done a, an office for a software firm? I said, no, but there's always a first time, right? But... So it took us a while to get there. We got our first break because Y2K was really big. Really, everyone was scrambling to design their offices and we got um, the first break there. And then once we had that, we just kept on and on and on. And so <clears throat> we got from 10,000 square feet to in those days about 100,000 square feet. Or I, I recollect we did a building in Seeps uh, where we remodeled an existing dilapidated structure into a new modern uh, IT building. So that was one of our first uh, architecture and interior projects. So this was a good, I'd say, eight, ten years into the career. Right. So it took me that long to forget a one building to design. Got so, it. You know, as a young architect, just out of college, uh, not many people were, uh, you know, confident enough uh, to get a building designed by a really newcomer. So that was the first uh, initial breaks. Again, but that was not an entire building. It was uh, actually much more challenging because it was there were many more parameters rather than just a green, plain greenfield slate. Uh, this was kind of remodeling the whole, it, and it was a completely dilapidated structure where we put in a basement and all, all, all of those things. So it was quite interesting. And then uh, through that, we also got another break, our first building that we designed from scratch in Bangalore. Uh, this was around in that... 98, 99 period, where we designed a cable strayed structure. So it's the same concept that you see on uh, the ceiling. Yeah. The entire structure was suspended on cables. It was a central core, and all the floors were suspended on cables. Okay. Uh, which is quite unique, which is quite unique even as we speak. Uh, so if you go to the... Uh, homepage on Facebook of Bangalore City, you'll still see that building. Got it. So even after all these years, 24 years now, we that still is have the that home. as a pretty iconic uh, structure in that. Oh. And then uh, we continue to do many, many, many more projects for the IT industry. And so if you see the journey of uh, the firm, we started off in Bombay. Uh, 
we went to Bangalore and we set up that office because we had quite a few projects going on there. We came back to Pune, despite having an office in Bangalore, uh, Bombay. We had uh, to set up the office in Pune because there was that many more number of projects happening in that geography. So, uh, and then we went to Hyderabad, and then we went to Gurgaon. So we've got five different offices, and if you see all these five different cities, that's where all the IT uh, companies focused. And then from IT, it went to fintech and financial uh, solutions and all of that. So I'd say now our projects would range anywhere between 50,000 square feet to probably over 4 million square feet uh, for some of these clients. And then from there, then we said, and, up, and all of that, up, until then, we were working with corporates. So like I said, uh, the firm also adapted that process of uh, setting up uh, the organization and we were pretty much operating more like a corporate than a architectural studio so to speak and uh, <clears throat> we were quite averse to working with developers at that time because in those days they were not really as developed as they are today we said we, we'd like to work in an environment which is more corporate and then Gradually, there were uh, quite a few developers that, you know, started operating like corporates. Some of the corporates got into real estate as well. And then we said, this is too much of a, a space where we haven't entered and it's about time that we enter. But being mindful of the kind of culture that we still want to continue working with, <clears throat> we started working with developers both for commercial buildings and then graduating into residential. large scale residential developments not not standalone residential buildings but larger uh, widely uh, you know, distributed and high density and high on luxury quotient got it so you started off on your own you're a first generation architect and Seeing the trend around, normally architects are, it's a industry, it's a sector where normally everyone is a newcomer. There are very few architects who are again born into an architectural family and get that uh, advantage of uh, and that uh, s boost. So you being that first generation, like the many who are there out and you have reached to a level that your business development acquisition team doesn't have to work to get projects. That's uh, not true. But That's not true. <laughs> you you do get projects today coming to your coming to you by themselves uh, instead of your team going out and uh, searching for projects. So I want to know that how what is that saturation point from someone as you started working on your own going out for projects acquiring projects to a point where projects start coming to you by themselves. So I guess uh, <clears throat> there's no saturation time or really defined saturation time or uh, period. It's more about what you can deliver or what you deliver. So we've reached a stage where we have 74% of our work that comes from repeat business, uh, which is very high. Uh, <clears throat> but... That's because of the kind of work that we deliver. And people are happy with what we deliver and we just come back to us. Uh, we do a lot of business development still, you know, because there are a, a lot of areas of work where we still really need to do that. Yes, people call us, uh, but there's always a comp competition or in all probability, from a process perspective also, large corporates, most of the MNC firms have that as a culture where, as a process, where they have to invite three or maybe four people to bid for a project. Yes, we have some uh, uh, MSAs as well, master service agreements with a few corporates where we have a three-year contract with them. So whatever projects that they would do over the next three years, 
uh, they would call us. They would either just directly appoint us or maybe have a panel of three or four architectural firms that they will keep continuously uh, giving projects to. But yes, we still have to compete uh, often enough. I want to touch upon the design aspects and how do you approach a project once the client approaches you? What is your method of planning and designing a space? So uh, everything starts from a brief. Right? Okay. Uh, where, a pro where a client comes and gives you a particular brief. And I'll give you an example of, let's say, an office for, for that matter. Uh, we'd like to challenge briefs. So if we're giving, uh, handing over, being handed over a set of requirements, we normally tend to challenge it and say, why is it that you want this? Right? You would just, the client would just give you a piece of paper. I need, I am employing 1,000 people or 2,000 people. Therefore, I need 2,000 work desks. I need so many meeting rooms and blah, 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 blah. So <clears throat> we would challenge there and said, yes, you are going to employ, you know, you're going to employ so many people. But why do you need so many desks? Okay. Why do you need so many meeting rooms? The answer in, 90% of the time would come, we have existing so many and they're always occupied, therefore we need a, that many plus X. And so we, we'd like to challenge that and say, let's first analyze how you are currently using all those meeting spaces, whether they are effectively being used or not. We, we use technology to do that. We use technology to map right down to the workstations. And <clears throat> in all the projects that we've done, it's a global standard that 70% desks are unoccupied in an organization, globally. It may, it may vary from industry to industry, but uh, on an average 70%, people are traveling, say, or, or whatever, right? So that much amount of real estate, imagine 30% of real estate is unoccupied. And most of these corporates probably have leased premises. So imagine the kind of rentals that they're spending for unoccupied spaces. So that's the advantage that we bring to the table where we say, we will challenge your brief for the better to optimize the space and your real estate and, you know, give you a much more efficient plan. You may have that much area, but how could you use it a little more effectively? You provide only that many workstations or keep a few more than what you would at peak occupy and I'd rather give you alternate work points or different settings or create different environments which will make uh, an employee more productive. The real estate. So it's real estate efficiency. In some cases, uh, people have cut down their needs of real estate. So if they're taking 100,000 square feet on lease, we would advise them to take 80,000 only because their needs would have been met in that much. Right. So we're actually becoming a partner to the organization by giving them a bigger return on their bottom line. so The real estate space is much more expensive than the interiors and planning part yeah, of it. Obviously, because that's a you know recurring cost. Definitely. Not just real, the, the, real, the actual real estate, but operating costs, air conditioning, lighting, and administrative costs. And How do you come to a conclusion that what is your process of finding that much space reduction is required by that firm? So like I said, technology, we we have uh, sensors that we would embed in existing premises of similar needs of the organization, right? So, uh, and we map the usage patterns over a period of time. So ideally it would be three months, more in, in excess of three months, which is ideal case where you can get a proper uh, mapping of uh, the, the, the movement and holidays and stuff like that, right? So three months and beyond is ideal to have where you could monitor, not just through technology, but also through uh, 
physical observations and behavioral patterns. So you could probably have been inside the office, but you're not at your desk. You could be in a you know cafe space or an amenity space, or you could be in a meeting room. So we do a more holistic kind of a approach to map user patterns and you know entries exit into the office and how all spaces within the office also are uh, getting utilized so in an office it's not just about work work areas it's more about uh, collaboration areas meeting rooms uh, cafeteria spaces amenity spaces so how are all of those getting used so we, we map all of those so now how we, we speak of how people are using cafe areas amenity spaces social spaces to do their uh, daily routine work as well and not preferring to uh, sit on that same location every day so it is a transition that we have witnessed over the years i would want you to speak about how the transition has happened since you have been working for few decades what for what was the kind of requirement at 2 uh, 3 decades ago of a typical office environment and how is it transitioning today to the kind of environment that people want to build and what does the future hold in terms of office spaces so uh, <clears throat> probably a couple of decades or maybe even a decade and a half uh, ago we were still trying to build uh, you know future ready offices so at that point of time we could proudly say that we are building an office which would last at least 8 8, eight 10 years you know, i'd be stupid if i say that now because the way of technology is moving it's 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 going rapidly so we we can't predict what's going to come 5 years from today but uh previously when we designed offices in most cases they used to be before open plan came into uh in picture we had quite a few enclosed office spaces and cabins and then the normal hierarchy as cubicles and then down to the workstations uh the arrangement used to be all the offices got the best views towards the windows and all the other junior people started get, getting into the central areas which now has completely changed the focus is more on on sustainability uh so we all we like to harness daylight so none of the enclosed spaces are towards the windows anymore we like most of the the larger amount of real estate to get natural daylight right in into the facilities so that uh they saving on energy and all so of that so cabins company. should not be next to the windows because they might block that they would they would always block uh, the much amount of natural light, light natural right. light coming into where where the larger population of uh the workforce would be right so right so that's where you would want them to be towards the windows it's, it's not about the views it's more about the natural daylight. so in that sense things have changed of course those cubicles and cabin culture has gone uh it's more open plan <coughs> hierarchies within organizations also have changed it's more flat uh so uh <coughs> the differentiation between the typologies of uh work areas has changed completely of course in a corporate setup uh the true corporate office or there for you know that would still be a little different but when we're talking about large workforces this is uh basically how it is done now any few changes you see in the next few years that would uh, be changed in the office working environment so it's it's a constant change right. uh, <clears throat> and you know uh there is always the need of and and now like i said earlier also we are providing for choice seating so it's not a fixed set not of a fixed seat set. it's a, it's a free address so with the advent of a lot of technology coming in people can work out of anywhere right so when i say anywhere uh, not necessarily work from home i'm saying anywhere within the office so you don't have to have your dedicated workstation but based on the tasks that you are going to carry out during the course of the day and you know on one day you could be just meeting people or collaborating with your uh, colleagues and you don't really need that individual focused work desk so why would that real estate be wasted so if we can provide for alternate work points or a 
give people a choice of seating that's more, much better to do and more effectively more effective and productive as as well as making real estate more efficient it comes down to the point of sustainability and would want to know how do you make sustainability a part of your office planning so i think <clears throat> about 15 years back uh, we mandated within the organization that we will design for sustainability and design for green irrespective of whether uh, any of our clients wants to really get officially certified that this project is green or sustainable we would normally design for uh, green certification so if a client wanted to apply for certification it would be very easy to say yes we checked all the boxes but <clears throat> it's uh, right from the basic design orientation of buildings material selection like we spoke about uh, location of enclosed areas harnessing daylight the use of materials uh, zero voc paints all of those factors come into uh, the whole gamut of sustainability not just sustainability <clears throat> is more about well-being and wellness within the office space as well so post covid there's a huge uh, impetus towards uh, wellness uh, we were doing that even before uh, the pandemic any differences you observed uh, pre covid and post covid in terms of office requirements by the clients yeah so i guess a lot of people now with policies of work from home and uh, you know a lot of in fact even today as we speak uh, some of the software firms are still at 50% occupancy occupancies and uh, <clears throat> so free address now is very common uh, it it we were doing free address for a few organizations even pre covid but uh, i would say they were a much more evolved lot of uh companies that had that as a option given to uh, organize or to their employees and make and they were really making much more use of their real estate um we did an office for microsoft pre pandemic where we had <clears throat> one work workstation for two and a half employees so uh, you know the capacity if if they had a thousand desks it could occupy to a half thousand employees so you know just with free address and with after covid it might have increased or it's so it depends it really depends on uh, what the firm's office is about so this one in particular was a marketing office so okay not many people who had to come in to work right. every day but uh, there are other organizations where you can't have that at all there are some uh, organizations which are pure r&d centers where you have dual monitors so you can't really use technology even to say i'll take my laptop and work out of anywhere so there are some organizations where you can do it you can do it uh, very very effectively but some cannot even, you won't be able to do it you know you, where you need some amount of people that would have to be uh, working on their own desks at any given period of time you work on 5000 10000 square feet uh, luxury villas and you work on million square feet master planning or planning projects as well what is the difference between working on both of these kind of projects somewhere your time is involved more effort is more or it's the same It, you you may find the scales to be completely different yes. one is really that big and the other Ma- one is yeah. uh, minuscule and then um i have people in the organization even come up to me and say how do you manage this so at one point i'm probably designing a desk or a workstation yes and in the next half an hour i'm working on a uh, layout a master plan of say about 100 acres or that but I think I've got adapted to switching scales very easily and uh but to answer your question about the time involved uh it's probably the same because 
you know, you're 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 doing design, you're thinking, you're being creative, and uh, you're trying to find a solution. But uh, yes, the amount of time that a larger project would take obviously is much more, because then when you're getting into, then you're getting into many more areas, many more details, and but at a conceptual level, it's probably the same. I feel more importance uh, uh, and much more effort might be involved in master plan because that has to be sustainable for f- a good amount of more years compared to an interior home or a villa. Of course. So when you're doing a master plan, you have to, <clears throat> I mean, a master plan or an architectural project, uh, you're designing for something that's to last 50 years and beyond. Whereas an interior uh, for an office typically or a villa, you'll probably say, 10, 15 years at, at max. For an office, I'd say 5 to 7 years. So, DSP designs, does interior designing, architectural, master planning, smart advisory, uh, building solutions. It is a kind of 360 kind degree services that you all are providing. And today, various architects are sticking to one particular service out of all of these and you have mastered all of them and are having that expertise in all of them. How did you reach to this point and what is your motto behind keeping on adding and expanding your portfolio of services? So actually, <clears throat> when you look back at our career graph, uh, we've added on uh, either a service or a vertical or a different geography every three years. Uh, so, you know, either we've added another city or we've We've grown from just doing commercial interiors to doing commercial architecture or residential architecture or hospitality. We we incorporated a firm that specializes only in education design, which is now designing schools or universities across 28 different countries now. Or we've had partnerships with uh, global firms. So every three years, there's been... I mean, not exactly every three years, but at an average every three years, we've had a newer development. So we add on one, consolidate, go on to the next, consolidate, and then move on to the next. So So it is like a milestone that you're having that every three years, you have to keep on adding on services or enter into a new area for the growth of the firm. So currently you are developing 50 million square feet of space, having 300 plus workforce and the teams are in different cities and nations. How much involvement of yours is there in each particular activity being done by the people on various different projects? So, uh, obviously physically it's not uh, possible for any individual to get involved in each and every aspect of all of this that we're doing. But... uh, between in the organizations, there's three of us as founders. We spearhead each and every project. One of us is spearheading uh, of any project. So we're not leaving it up to uh, others to do it. But we have created the second rung of leadership who are stalwarts or within the industry themselves. So people have been with us for over a decade and a half or probably even two decades and, you know, who are speakers at international forums, domestic forums. So they're stalwarts on their own. <clears throat> and uh, when when there's a new project that comes, comes in, we brainstorm and for architecture or interior design or for master planning, uh, we get together, we, we call, whilst we still have studios in five different geographies, we're still one organization. So we probably pick out a team or we select a team out of different geographies to to make so so we get different minds working on it so it's not a biased kind of an approach and uh, we come together collaborate uh, deliberate and uh, come up with a basic conceptual strategy and then we take it on from there so we're involved in every milestone every stage uh, and then that's when I am involved in conceptualizing and up to the schematic stage and then the localized team uh, takes over. I want to understand your definition of luxury. 
So luxury is uh, today the word has been abused a lot, and uh, you know the the way it is so loosely uh, used that you know some people could call luxury only as uh, you have something that is a luxury brand, and that defines luxury for people. Uh, <clears throat> We believe that uh, luxury is more about an experience. And it, uh, the experiences could be anything. It could be a holiday, for that matter. But uh, in the real estate context, I would say it's more about luxury of the experience of a space. Right? It could have a very basic floor. It could have basic wall finishes. But to have the right volume of space for that particular use. It would be different from an office to a residence to a hotel or for an education institute. The needs are different. So the way you organize and curate those experiences is what I would call as, which would define luxury. So definitely not using, just using that Branded tile or branded furniture doesn't mean... No, like I said, it's not about uh, the use of materiality or a particular brand of furniture. You can get ergonomics through, you know, basic furniture or the aesthetic could come out as more pronounced by localized tiles or you know, flooring materials. You could use basic flooring material and still have a luxury uh, in, uh, kind of an environment. Can you share some of your luxury projects that you have executed and which are close to you? So I'd say, uh, you know, there's this one project that we did for an organization called TomTom. Uh, they're into navigation tools and they were the ones who did those before Google started uh, Google. <coughs> and uh, no, that's where we implemented technology also. We mapped how uh, the user patterns were in from a thousand uh, people office or employee where they had mentioned we want thousand deaths. We ended up providing only 500 fixed seats and 400 odd uh, alternate work points. And there was a luxury of choice seating for all the employees where people could work out of anywhere from within those spaces. And uh, that's what luxury is, right? If you go to a workspace where you could say, today, I'm <clears throat> because my task is this, I'm going to be in a focused environment of focused working, or I have <clears throat> the luxury of sitting anywhere else to perform that particular task, that's luxury, right? Otherwise, imagine if you're one of those thousand people and you're coming to that one particular desk every day to perform different tasks on one desk without that environment being provided to you for the different type of work, you're not going to be productive. So, <clears throat> Fair enough. The other, On the other side, uh, on a residential project, there's luxury of space that one would create. Yes. Right? So there, there are some villas that we've designed which have uh, which resonate luxury in a different manner, not necessarily in the choice of materiality, but in the way the spaces have been curated. Got it. Volumes, heights, areas. So it is not materialistic at all? No. Coming to... Uh, not in my... Definitely I would agree with you on that point. Now coming to how hospitals Fatality is being implemented on commercial and residential projects in the last few years and how much importance it has been given by various home purchasers or clients and the kind of amenities and services they want to provide to their home buyers. I want to know your experience uh, 10 years down the line and how it has changed to today. So, uh, I'd say <clears throat> about a decade ago, uh, the amenities were just a you know tick box on how how much you could say you would provide to the end user, and say I have provided this. It was just a check in the box, you know. And and there are some norms uh, 
that we have in the real estate uh, business where you say you have you can provide only 4% uh, which is within the FSI or free of FSI as amenity spaces that you are permitted but people now uh, and developers real estate developers have are stretching that to provide much more in and in some cases we are going even up to 12% of spaces which are amenity spaces in a residential building because that's the kind of luxury that they want to provide in terms of amenity spaces for the end users again uh, size of apartments also have changed the needs have changed post covid uh, unit sizes have become much larger we've seen this huge impetus of uh, much larger spaces much larger apartments even in a city like mumbai where you know we have Three and a half thousand, four thousand square feet, or five thousand square feet as uh, apartment sizes in South Bombay, which where ticket prices have now gone to fifty crores and hundred crores, and that, that, that's the kind of trend that we have today. Any hospitality elements that you make sure you want to implement in your residential commercial projects? So all our projects have that question of uh, the hospitality coming coming into. uh both the residential as well as commercial spaces so uh there is this whole need of and more so from where we provide all the amenity spaces right uh, in residential buildings it's the, the concierge services and you know people want that kind of uh, living li- living in there now i have heard a lot about alibag and how you are redefining the luxury with the villas that you have designed and are building in alibag and how you have transitioned from being an designer architect in alibag to being a developer yourself so i want to know the whole journey of yours and your connection with alibag that you have so i i've had my home in alibag i've started building my home 28 years ago and i'm still in the process of uh, building up upgrading it and building on more uh, there <coughs> So you know the journey for me in Alibag has been forever. Uh my kids have almost been brought up there every every weekend or every other weekend we used to you know schools over and Alibag and come back. So it is a very dear uh, space to me and and the family so we used to spend a lot of time there. Uh we never had televisions till only very recently so we used to be want to stay cut off from the world. <clears throat> but uh we had a great time and a super opportunity to live there for 2 years at a stretch during the pandemic so i i worked out of there and uh you know it was it was really a great time where i i never wore a wa- mask i never knew what a mask uh, would feel like until i came back uh after 2 years uh but over time we saw uh during that period i saw a lot, a lot of developments happening in and around that area and up until then we never used to do or focus too much on uh building villas or residential interiors for that matter <clears throat> a couple of friends of mine said why don't you build something for me and while you're there you can implement and do it so so we got down to even before the pandemic we started with one project and two projects uh just out of uh, need for another uh, excuse to go to alibag right so we started with that and then we did a few <clears throat> and then a lot of people came back to me and said no you've done a great job do this for me and do that for me and then in the pandemic we had a little bit additional time to move around and explore the whole place so we saw a few developments happening and uh, over time i had a few parcels of land i said let me also try my hand at it and see uh me implement some of my own practices into developments and try and provide a better product than what is out there and we said <clears throat> let's go on and we started kala gate collective and uh, yeah is this taken off from there how did you name the collective kala gate so um, like i said 28 years back we were in alibag and that at that point of time 
Ali Bagh was a really pristine area uh, where <clears throat> the density was very low. There were very few people there. So on this one stretch of road, from the road from Mandwa right up to Ali Bagh, or for that matter, till Awas where we live, there were hardly any gates on the main road. And we used to go get off at the jetty and travel by public transport. And there was one black gate, which was ours. We used to ask them to stop at that black gate, which the locals started calling it Kala Gate. So, you know, that's how we coined it. And then <clears throat> when we were all together, we said, we now have to give our house a name. Uh, we thought of Bogan Villa and all of those very cliched names and not, nothing really resonated with us. And then we just said, Kala Gate. It's, it's, you know, we're called that. Why don't we just continue with that? And then my wife, uh, who's a graphic designer, you know, <clears throat> made the whole logo and it's a nice little logo and we've coined it Kala Gate. So Kala Gate Collective has started from there. What is your vision for that whole collective? We, we want to provide uh, uh, spaces that people would really enjoy and would try and have the same experience and journey that we enjoyed during our period of living there uh, and to have that kind of a living. Now, I would want to discuss more on the kind of culture that you would want to inhibit in your organization. So we already have a best place to work at for the last uh, two years now, and we will continue with that and uh, take it to another level, actually, where people really enjoy coming here to work. So all the facilities and amenities that we provide and have provided in all our offices, uh, and you're seeing some of them here in the office, which are really uh, people-centric, and uh, people really enjoy coming to work here. You do really have a wonderful and a beautiful office that you have designed. You have any uh, thing uh, like working on a residential office or a hospitality project? In some ways, some is easier to execute, to plan compared to another. All the projects that we do have different complexities. I I wouldn't call one uh, more complicated than the other. Uh, we like to work on complicated projects. So we're currently appointed for a mixed-use development. It's a, it's a fairly large site. We started off with the, the brief of having a completely residential uh, development in Borivoli. Uh, <laughs> but uh, now the brief has changed to from the residential component. Um, there's retail, there's a commercial building, and a hotel. Uh, 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 plan now so it adds a whole new dimension of complexities in terms of circulation parking and all of those so I mean yes uh, that project is more complex now from a straightforward residential development to a mixed use development 10 years down the line how do you see yourself uh, in the whole architectural world Retired, sitting on an island, having a drink. You would like traveling a lot? Yeah, yeah. The places that you like to visit the most? So there are quite a few, but I think Italy takes it. And where can people get the most inspiration in the, uh, in the point of view of an architecture or design? Go to a forest. Go to a forest. Uh, you know, because architecture inspiration can come from anywhere. Okay. It's not necessary that you go and see a building and you get inspired. For me, inspiration or conceptual ideas can come from a leaf, right? So you could go to a jungle. There's so many textures, so many colors, everything. So, yeah, go to a forest. For you, a forest has been a great source of inspiration? No, not that. I'm saying not necessarily a forest. I could walk on the street, get inspiration. And still get inspiration. Yeah. yeah. So there's no favorite. Got it. Does anything like that is there that with time to time you draw different uh, sources of inf inspiration from different places? Not necessarily. Like I said, it, the inspiration could come from any, in, anywhere. It would really also depend on <clears throat> what type of a project you're working on, what's the, what's the solution that is really required, 
So when we're working for a corporate, the inspiration can come from their brand, from their values, from their colors that they have. or And <clears throat> it's more about contextuality of how we adapt all of those into what the need of that particular organization's office in that geography is about. You have uh, planned out various super tall structures in the city of South, in the city of Bombay and South Bombay particularly. What were, how was your experience and challenges you faced while designing a tall superstructure? So I'll go back to when uh, we were given or when we were pitching hard for our first tall structures and you know again same question have you done a building that tall and have you and then when we got our first few breaks in uh, tall buildings and then there was no end to it and we've, we've designed uh, structures in excess of 200 meters I mean 200 meters today has become like a like a norm right so we've done a car park structure which is 17 levels high so in other cities, uh, still there are buildings which are not even 17 stories. So we, we design car parks which are 17 levels high. Uh, <clears throat> so the, I'm not going to name buildings, but uh, there were some projects where we had a master plan developed where there were six towers going up uh, in excess of 100 floors, but then there was a cap on from the aviation ministry and we had to curtail that to 260 meters. And then from there, we've done a lot of buildings which are over 250 meters high, quite a few them in South Bombay. Any particular precautions or things that an architect has to keep in mind for planning out these tall structures? Structure, basically. Structure. Okay. Uh, and you have to make sure that your cores are tight, your structure, structural stability is there. Slenderness ratios have to be kept in check. Do you get architectural uh, restrictions in terms of designing tall structures in terms of the facade? Yeah, of course. So for facade also, you have to be mindful of wind loads, where where the project is located and factor in all of those. So again, more from the structure, not just RCC structure or, or the main structure of the building, but also in terms of the facade, the type of glass, uh, safety, railing heights and those are all things that one needs to. So it indeed was a great uh, discussion in terms of getting insights into a Indian architectural firm starting by one man itself to now having a workforce of 300 plus people and how you have grown in the past three to four decades and how heights you have reached representing the Indian architectural in the international space and knowing about how you have scaled with adding on services, locations with every three to five years in your portfolio. It is something really exciting, inspiring for a young architect and would love to be somewhere where people uh, see you at a benchmark position. I'm really glad to host you and it indeed was a really insightful session and did get me various learnings about the new office planning that we might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'd like to call ourselves Indian-born multinational firm. Thank you so much. Thank you.